Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, I couldn't catch uh, Shackleton. I don't know, Shackleton ran every time he suspected he was going to be in a uh, YouTube star, YouTube video star. So, so this is Sally. Sally's not quite as fast as Shackleton, so, but uh, she's shedding like crazy, so I don't know how long she'll stick around. But in this video, I'm going to talk all about global linkages, a graphic look at the changing Arctic. It's a, it's a new UN report. And it, the report itself hasn't been talked about in great detail. It just came out. But what was in it, there was a lot of uh, mainstream media that reported on, you know, one particular item in the report, which said that the Arctic was locked into three to five degrees Celsius of warming. And I talked about that a little bit in the uh, in my two previous videos. But in this video, I'm going to focus just on the report and let you know uh, what's happening. So. It does explain things quite nicely in the Arctic, not just the sea ice and things, but the whole gamut of changes with the cryosphere, including the ice and snow cover, uh, with short, short lived um, pollutants like methane and uh, black carbon and tropospheric ozone, which is formed when methane breaks down in the uh, troposphere and uh, all of these other different things, ocean acidification, biodiversity changes, all of these things. It'll probably take me a couple videos. So this is an excellent um, report, like I said. It's put out by the UN Environment and a number of other different groups. Um, and uh, I'm going to look just at the figures in here um, for the most part. So things that it covers, it talks about... Um, and my computer is responding slow to my mouse inputs. Okay, so uh, there. Okay, so it talks about the people living in the Arctic, about 4 million people, 10% um, First Nations. Um, the, the majority, uh, the populations with the majority of um, the Indigenous people are in Canada and Greenland, and uh, the Indigenous are um, in the minority in the other parts of the Arctic, most notably in Russia. So it talks about climate change, the cryosphere, permafrost, short-lived climate pollutants, ocean acidification, then about other contaminants like plastics and mercury and uh, where they're coming from and the concentrations in the Arctic and biodiversity, migratory species, invasive species, um, zoonosis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing. So this is transmission of viruses and things from animals to humans, protected areas, and so on. Okay, so change is clearly accelerating the Arctic and it has global implications for all of us. We all have a stake in the future, but none more than the young people who are coming of age, living in the midst of change. And, you know, it was nice globally, we had 1.4 million students, mostly students marching um, around the world on a Friday. They went on strike from school and uh, they had tremendous support. So there is one passage here that says, the Arctic people have a saying, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic, to create awareness about the critical role the Arctic plays in sustaining all life on this planet. Okay, so let's have a look at the figures here. So um, I'll just go down here. I'll use the scroll bar because it's a lot easier. Let's go down on this side. Okay, so this is um, this is Arctic population and development. So the blue, the so as we go around the Arctic, the blue are non-indigenous people, and the yellow are indigenous. This is a zero to one hundred percent scale. So you can see mostly non-indigenous people over on this side of the Arctic, and mostly indigenous people on the Canadian side and on the Greenland side. These are population centers. Um, so 300,000 people, Murmansk. Um, mostly it's defined the Arctic as from 60 to 90 degrees north latitude. These are other, some other large cities over on the Russia side. There's uh, Anchorage, Alaska up here. Okay, um, these are oil and gas fields, the gray areas. So you can see them, you know, many, you know, up in Alaska here and on the uh, Russia, Asia side, some in Europe some right in the ocean itself. 
Um, large mines. These squares here are large mines, and you can see lots of large mines scattered around, and there's one, two, three, four, at least in Greenland here. Um, the main transport routes for raw materials um, are shown, you know, are some of these lines here. Okay, um, the arrows are showing some of the main transport routes. Now, let me uh, go to the next one, Indigenous Peoples. Okay. My computer is going slow here. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, to bear with me for a second. Okay, so the Indigenous Peoples that live in the Arctic. Okay, Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, R-A-I-P-O-N. And then there's different groups of people here. This is the Inuit here, um, different councils, the Aleutian International Association, Arctic Athabasca Council, and so on. Okay, so these are the different um, spreadings of the Indigenous people in the Arctic. And over here, um, Arctic climate change. So what it's doing is it's looking at these representative concentration pathways from the intergovernmental panel on climate change. So it's comparing, it's taking the, the um, RCP, a mid scenario, RCP 4.5 scenario. The Paris is RCP 2.6. Our present trajectory is RCP 8.5 and there's a few others. So it's comparing under this scenario what it's showing here is it's taking a transect here. It's showing the sea ice extent in September 1981 is the solid white line here. And the dashed line is what it's projecting for autumn 2080 to 2100. And, you know, <laughs> you know, I think and many others are starting are really starting to think that, you know, we don't have much longer for the Arctic sea ice before we have the first uh, blue ocean event. OK, so. So if we take a transect from A to B here, then you get this um, image here. And what this is showing, this is showing the expected temperature, near surface temperature rise in for the 2080s relative to 85 to 2005. Uh, and once again, you know, I would shift all of these time frames much closer to the present. I mean, 2080s, come on, stuff's happening so fast now. You know, we're likely to see this in a few dec a decade or two or three, I think. But anyway, this is showing the temperature rise in various locations. So you get Svalbard here around Svalbard, very hot. And this is in the uh, cold season from December to February. So you get a lot of warming in the winter and very high warming. Uh, that's about 11 degrees Celsius near Svalbard. And this region here is also very warm. Um, in the Beaufort Sea, um, that's about, uh, if I eyeball it, that's about eight and a half degrees Celsius warming. Now, interesting, what it shows is during the warm season, it shows very little warming, and it, especially over the Arctic Ocean. So what does this mean? What this means is that this particular model um, assumes that the sea ice will still be there to reflect a, a, away a lot of the solar radiation to keep the Arctic Ocean relatively near zero right? Because most of the heat going into the Arctic then would be melting sea ice, so that would be late, that wouldn't raise the temperature. So this near surface temperature, as long as there's sea ice, it's going to be close to zero. But as soon as there's no sea ice, that refrigerator effect, that latent heat effect is lost, and you get skyrocketing temperatures. Okay, so take this stuff with a grain of salt, but, um, you know, the absolute time scales for things happening, but there's a lot of good information here. Um, so this is showing some of the Arctic climate feedbacks. We've got Greenland with the glacier here. We've got fresh water melting and, cask and, and cask um, calving glaciers on the coastlines as there's no sea ice. It's like taking the cork out of the bottle and the, there can be a lot more calving. Um, this is the solar energy coming in. White, as long as there's white surfaces, you get a lot of reflection. Less and less sea ice, less and less snow cover, darker surfaces underneath. There's a lot more absorption, a lot more heating of the surface waters, okay? Rivers, as the land is warming a lot more than the oceans, the rivers are discharging. There's a lot more meltwater going into the rivers. The rivers are feeding a lot more fresh water 
into the Arctic Ocean, okay? Um, there's also other feedbacks that are not on here, like I often talk about the jet stream waviness, the ridges bringing huge amounts of warm air into the Arctic, and the troughs bringing huge amounts of cold air out of the Arctic, which is effectively warming the Arctic. And also about the, the warming, the mixing of the water in the Arctic Ocean is getting much greater, so the warm, salty water underneath is mixing with the colder, fresh water on the surface, so all that heat is, is greatly contributing to the ice melt as well. Okay, so let's move on to the, okay, so this is sea level rise and ocean current. And let's just move down to the melting cryosphere. Okay, so here's the globe, here's the Arctic up here in this particular display. And what you see are the ocean currents. So uh, on this map, North America is up here, Florida is over here. And you get the Gulf Stream coming across, and then the water, so the, the warm salty water from the Gulf Stream is coming up across, and it cools down um, and uh, as it goes northward, and it's salty, so it sinks to the bottom to the abyss, and it recirculates around here. Okay, um, this is, uh, so, you, so this is uh, deep water formation in this region. Now, this cold water from down below starts to come up here, to the surface and gets heated up, contributing to the warm water flow on the surface, warm shallow currents in the Indian Ocean. Um, and it also, we also get it to, um, what happens is the cold water here, the cold saline deep current gets warmed up, gets forced upward, upwelled against coastlines, etc. here, and becomes surface water, is warmed up as it goes southward and loops back here. So you get this global conveyor belt, thermohaline circulation system. Um, and the coastal zones, it's showing major coastal zones that are most vulnerable to rising sea levels and floods. So there's lots of humans there, there's lots of infrastructure, there's a huge problem to, um, you know, to people living on coastlines as sea level rise uh, rapidly accelerates. Now, the melting cryosphere, Okay, this is showing, this image here is showing the melting cryosphere. So the medium ice edge for the period 1981 to 2010 is the red dashed line. Okay, sea ice extent in September 2018 is here, shown here, the blue area in the center. And sea ice extent in September of 1981 is shown, that's the minimum extent rate right? in September is shown as the white border, so the sea ice is retreating, fresh water input is put into the ocean, um, and um, this is showing the main marine transport routes during the summer, um, through here, through the Northwest Passage, through the Northeast Passage, and what's projected to be opened up, these will be passages, um, you know, right through the center as, as the ice goes. And the discharge of the main rivers is also shown. So we've got the Lena River here with the most discharge, the, the Yenisee here, the Ob here, lots of discharge. Okay, this is 590 cubic kilometers a year. Um, the smaller one here is 300 cubic kilometers per year. And these ones are about 120 cubic kilometers per year. And then there's some from the Mackenzie and also up here. Okay, so those are showing the melting cryosphere points. Now permafrost is a sleeping giant in the Arctic and it's awakening. So let's go down and, and have a look. Okay, so what we see here is, okay, so permafrost. So we've got receding ice caps. Okay, we've got rock falls and landslides. We've got the permafrost layer here, the purple layer. There's an active layer right near the surface, and that layer thaws out and refreezes each year. And there's sawing permafrost within. Um, and that can create a lot of coastal erosion from wave action. It can create rock falls. There's also release of CO2 and methane from the permafrost, and there's all kinds of implications of that. Now we'll go over here, thawing permafrost, and I'll continue this in another video. So thanks.